G'day and welcome to the third of my three videos on how to integrate. Uh, in the first one I looked at the six basic forms and how to avoid some confusion over them. The second video was dealing with the chain rule, or at least with the reverse of the chain rule. And in this one we're going to look at the reverse of the product rule. Now you will know that when we find, for example, the derivative with respect to x of uh, instead of using fx, gx, for example, I just use uv, that's common. The derivative of the product of two functions is the first function times the derivative of the second plus the derivative of the first function times the derivative of the second or the other way around. That is our product rule for differentiation. If we want to integrate, we can remove these and put it in the integral form and integrate. It's nice and simple. Now the integral of the derivative of uv is just uv because the integral is the inverse function of the derivative. They undo each other. So we're back to what we started with. And here we have the integral of u dv plus the integral of, I'll write it in reverse, of v du. So how do we rearrange this? If I move this over here, I get uv minus the integral of u dv. And then we writing this in reverse, the integral of v du equals uv minus the integral of u dv. This is the form of integration that derives from the product rule when we differentiate. So if we use the product rule of differentiating, we use this rule to integrate, and this rule is not called the product rule, it's called integration by parts. simply because the u and the v are different parts of the expression. Now, this is an advanced technique in our schools in New South Wales. Only the extension students deal with this. But why is it so useful? It's useful when we get integrals that don't conform to the standard patterns, the six standard patterns that we're used to. That is the derivative of sine, cos and tan, or x to the power n, or e to the x, or log x. There's some weird combination of them. For example, if I had the integral of cosine of x dx, hopefully you'd find that very easy to, to deal with. But if I had x times that, that is a product of these two functions, that is decidedly more difficult. But I want you to notice if we follow this pattern, then I can rearrange this and replace cos x dx with d of sine x. Why can I do that? Because the derivative of sine x is cos x. Have a look at this. The derivative of sine x is, I think you'll agree, the cosine of x. That means, if I multiply both sides by dx, I get the derivative of sine x is cos x dx. So I can replace that cos x dx with the derivative of sine x. And now it's in this form. I have a function times the derivative of another function. And by pushing the cosine inside there, getting the complicated function in there, it means that something rather marvellous happens. First of all, I get an expression that involves no integral at all. Remember, we integrated the derivative, so it's back to original functions. So it's u times v. If that's my u and that's my v, this is going to be x sine x. 
minus the integral and now we swap these around so I move the sine x outside d and I move the x inside And I think you can see that what was a complicated integral by moving the complicated expression inside the derivative allowed us to get a relatively simple expression minus a derivative that we can deal with. And you know that the integral of sine x is negative cos x. So I'll just because the derivative of the cosine is negative sine. There you go, derivative cosine is negative sine. There it is. That is an integral performed using integration by parts. What a clever technique. But it's based on a reversal of the product rule from differentiation. My recommendation to you, before you get far too far involved with this, is that each time you sit down to study this, and probably each afternoon for the next few afternoons. You start by doing exactly what I did. Do Find the derivative of uv and rub out the dx's, integrate and derive this. It's only four or five lines of work. Derive it each time. See how they're connected. Get a feel for it. And then once you're used to this, learn to use the pattern, just practice and practice and practice. Traditionally, or usually, when you've got two functions, it's the complicated one that you look to get inside the derivative. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, this will be a shorter video, but I will show, than the previous two, I will show a few examples to hopefully clarify it for you. It's a marvellous tool. Let's do it. Well, here we go. I've written it up the top, and I, I need to point something out before we get going. When we carried out that product rule at the beginning of the video, and I brought one term over with the UV, it didn't matter which of the two terms came over. Uh, what I mean by that is if I brought this back over here, it would become a plus V to U, and then I could move this over here. In other words, it really doesn't matter which way around the u's and the v's are when you write it out. So if you did the integral of v du, you'd still have your uv, it's the same as vu, the reversal doesn't matter, minus the integral of u dv. Don't get too uptight over it, just remember it's uv minus whatever the reversal is. So let's imagine we've got another one, let's imagine we've got x e to the x. And we're going to try to evaluate this. Now, it doesn't conform to the chain rule property, where the, the derivative of x is 1, and I'd expect to have a 1 out the front, not an x. So it's not like the integrals we were doing in the last video. This is definitely something that we need to use the um, integration by parts for. So what we do is we try to get this more difficult integral inside. And we can do that because the integral of e to the x is e to the x. Again, if you wish to check this on the, outside, on the side of the page, find the derivative of e to the x, which is e to the x, move the dx up over here, and there you have the equivalent. So the e to the x dx that we have here, get my head out of the road, I'll, un I'll underline it, exactly matches the derivative of e to the x v. Now this is in a form where we have u dv. What do we get on the right hand side? We get u times v minus the integral of that d that. In other words, the e to the x comes out and the x goes inside just like 
we swap the U and the V over. So it's actually a very simple little structure when you're used to it. And of course the integral of e to the x dx is e to the x. How nice is that? Now without this method we would be pretty much lost. It's a very powerful method and a very useful one. Of course if we had a definite integral we could just evaluate this within limits and we'd be right. Let's try another one. What if we were doing the logarithm of x dx? Now you might look at this and think, but we don't have a function times something to move this difficult thing inside. No, we don't. But we do have already a function times d something. So sometimes an expression like this is already set up for us, even though the more difficult function's on the outside. Let's have a look. What does it say to do with the integral of log x? Well, it says the integral of u dv gives uv, so we multiply these functions, x times log x, minus, and then in the next integral, we reverse what these were. So the x pops out the front, and we find the derivative of log x. You can see that those two have reversed positions. Well, what on earth is this? <clears throat> well, to, to work out what this is, if you're not confident with it, on the side of your page, find d by dx of log x. Because you can see that d log x is what we have here. Now, the derivative of log x is 1 over x, isn't it? And if I multiply both sides by dx, I get... Or dx over x. So I can replace that with this. So I've got the integral of x times 1 over x dx. Now that's rather nice because x times 1 over x is 1. And that is one of your most basic integrals from when you first learnt to integrate. I think we're just going to fit this on the page. x log x minus the integral of 1 is x plus c. So we've done, we've performed two integrations here using integration by parts as a method. I'm going to do one more to show you that sometimes it's not all as smooth sailing as this, but it can lead to something quite interesting. And... Uh, I would like to show you that example. But I hope this is making sense and you just need, as I say, to derive this a number of times, to be confident with it, and then to use it a number of times. And please learn to set your work out nicely. It will help the flow and help you follow the structure. And that will protect you from making too many careless mistakes and from getting too confused. Let's have a look at this last example. Now, before I get stuck into this last example, I should point out, you will probably have noticed that I haven't been using substitution. When I was taught at school, and when so many people are taught uh, this method, we're taught to set up u equals some function, v equals some function, and do the derivatives and all the rearranging on the side of the page, and substitute. Uh, let me say I think that is an excellent thing to do, and I think substitution is an extraordinarily powerful tool to use for finding integrals and things like that. And in some of the following videos, when I work through Karonius' 100 integral list, uh, you will see that I'll resort to that. But once you've done it for a while, once you start to see the patterns, I encourage you to break free from it because my experience is all the u's and v's and the substitutions actually make you take a step or two back from seeing the pattern and you lose sight of the pattern. And if you can learn the six basic patterns well and how to adapt them to this, uh, mostly you shouldn't get confused. I would only resort to substitution if it was a particularly difficult or intractable problem. But when it's something fairly straightforward, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to do it the way I'm doing and, and to try and practice that way.
but certainly don't disparage substitution, but I thought I should explain why I'm not doing it. Now, I wrote down, here we go. What happens if I've got something like x cubed e to the x dx? What happens with this? Well, this actually opens up a whole field of mathematics. Uh, where you're dealing with long series of expressions and with the right expressions, infinite series. So an integral can produce an infinite uh, series. Let me show you how this one would develop. Because the derivative of this function inside is not x cubed, it's actually 1, the derivative of x is 1. This doesn't perform, conform to the pattern of a, um, a chain rule. So we use integration by parts. I'm going to move the e to the x inside the derivative. Oh, sorry, d, e to the x. And now, because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, so that's nice and simple. Once it's inside, this is going to give me x cubed, e to the x, u times v, minus the integral of e to the x d with the derivative x cubed. Now if we work this out, the derivative of x cubed is going to be 3x squared. I'll leave the e to the x there, the x. We can check this out. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared and multiply both sides by dx. So that derivative is 3x squared dx, 3x squared dx. Now I hope you notice, I'll, I'll move the 3 outside, that I've got x squared e to the x instead of x cubed e to the x now. It's reduced this power by 1 but I've got the same problem all over again. So I'm going to write x squared d e to the x. And guess what? I, I use integration by parts on that as well. So this will be x cubed e to the x minus 3. Lots of integration by parts will be that times that minus the integral of e to the x d x squared. Multiplying both these things inside by negative 3, we could separate the terms. We've now got two lovely terms out here. And I hope you notice that when we rearrange this, if I find the derivative, this will be the integral of 2x e to the x dx. And our power now has dropped again from x squared to x. And we would use integration by parts a third time and we would get extra terms. But it would allow us to whittle it down until we completed the integral. So the rule with integration by parts is that sometimes, sometimes when you have a, a, an expression, some uh, function, to a fairly high power, it's like stitching or knitting. You just work your way along and you can produce a whole string of these expressions as you work down to bedrock. So integration by parts can give you some very interesting results. And uh, particularly when you get in the field of trigonometry, where you're integrating sine to the power 12 or sine to the power 60x, you'll start to see all sorts of things unfold. I'll leave that for some of my future videos, but this was just to show you that the integration by parts doesn't always work in one go. Sometimes its result will also need to be dealt with by integration by parts and maybe a third, fourth, fifth, sixth time. And therein lies an interesting study. Enough said. I hope the, I hope the video has helped you understand integration by parts. I hope the examples have illustrated that 
sufficiently well for you and that you can practice until you are good at them. I would appreciate your comments and feedback. Uh, I'd love it if you could click on the like button. If you're not a subscriber, then please join the club. Click on the subscribe button and learn about my future videos. And as always, I thank you very much for watching.